All right, everybody, we're going to get started. Um, hello, once again, my name is Jen Fagan-Fry. I am the NOAA Institutional Repository Manager. I am here with Sarah Davis, our Senior Bibliometrics Librarian. And this is our fourth installment in our NOAA IR Brown Bag series. Uh, before I jump in, though, there's a couple of housekeeping things I'd like to address. Um, we are going to have one last IR Brown Bag in October. Uh, the one in October will focus on using the IR, the Institutional Repository, as a research tool. Uh, we're going to highlight some of the new developments. We have a couple new things that will be deploying in the next few weeks that are very exciting. So we're going to cover those. Um, we're going to cover uh, how to navigate in the IR, how to search, uh, some of the additional features that we're adding. So please tune in for that. I think if you are registered for the series, you'll get a notification for that. And then I also wanted to tell everyone that we are recording this presentation today as always. It will be available on the library's brown bag page, but we have also just launched a new YouTube channel. Uh, there is the NOAA Central Library YouTube channel where all of our videos for our brown bags, um, the Knaus Fellow series, these IR brown bags, any of our 508, um, Section 508 videos are all available on the YouTube channel. Uh, we have some curated playlists, so please check there as well. Um, and then with that, I think I'm going to just jump in. If you have any questions uh, for the folks online, please put them in the question panel. Katie Rowley, our outreach librarian, is here. She is going to monitor that while we're speaking, and we will do questions at the end as usual. So um, today we are going to cover the what, whys, and hows of the No Institutional Repository. As I said, this is the fourth one in our series. We've done a number of these, and we've gotten a lot of feedback from all of you, uh, which we greatly appreciate. It's helped us sort of develop what topics to cover, uh, some improvements that we should make to the repository, our process, that sort of stuff. So we do appreciate all the feedback, but a number of questions have also come from, uh, from you in the field and here in Silver Springs. So um, what we have done is we have taken a number of the frequently asked questions or common questions and sort of condensed them into this presentation. So what we are going to cover today is um, we've had a number of questions about gray literature and how it relates to the repository. We've had a number of questions about submitting to the repository and why you should submit to the repository. We are going to go over Section 508 just briefly, uh, mostly because we do have a separate Section 508 series of uh, informational presentations. So we're just going to touch on that. And then um, we are also going to discuss how the institutional repository differs from the bibliometrics list and how different identifiers like ORCIDs, DOIs, and researcher IDs relate to the IR. And then again, we'll have that Q&A at the very end. So what is gray literature? Gray literature, according to the fourth international conference on gray literature from 1999, is that which is produced on all levels of government, academics, business and industry in print and electronic formats, but which is not controlled by commercial publishers. Oftentimes the example given when discussing greater literature is government reports or um, annual reports, things of that nature. So based on this definition, most NOAA publications and right now we're talking about NOAA publications, not journal articles, are considered gray literature. So tech memos, tech reports, stock assessments, biological opinions, um, uh, weather assessments, all those types of things are considered gray literature. So that means, yes, we accept gray literature into the repository because that's by definition, sort of a bulk of what NOAA is publishing that is not going to journals. So again, this is excluding peer-reviewed journal articles. Um, with that being said, if you ever have a question about whether your document should be submitted to the repository, you can always send it to us and we will review it and then respond to you with, with a determination. Uh, when we do that, we try to give an explanation as to why we include it or why we will not include it. 
if we do not um, include the include the document, we do try to offer some sort of guidance as to the best way to preserve that, where it should be posted, how it should be accessed. So the second question, why should I submit to the NOAA IR? Um, this is sort of something we've covered at length over these, but, but there's a couple different aspects to it. Uh, most commonly people say, well, why should I submit? What's in it for me? I know I have to what's in it for me. So I'm going to cover the easiest and simplest answer of you have to do it. It's a mandate uh, based on the NOAA PAR plan, the plan for increasing public access to research results. Any NOAA publications have to be submitted to the, the institutional repository, um, all materials that were published after October 1st, 2015. There's your short answer. You have to do it. In addition, there is the NOAA Administrative Order 205-17A about information access and dissemination. I have linked to that here, uh, so please take a look at it. It uh, discusses a number of different things in regards to the distribution of NOAA publications and NOAA research, but specifically related to the IR and sending things to the library, um, in Section 8, it, sa it states, the NOAA Central Library must receive a digital copy of each NOAA-authored or NOAA-sponsored scientific, technical, or administrative publication produced. Uh, the library must also receive the URL addresses for all NOAA-authored or NOAA-sponsored remote electronic documents and an electronic copy for each remote electronic document to archive and provide access to the public. So initially, uh, the administrative order kind of predated the PAR plan. So when the administrative order refers to provide access to the public, that initially was via the library's catalog. Now that we have the repository, it's an easier way for us to provide that access. So why else should you submit to the repository? I, I get that you have to, right? There's a, there are other reasons and good reasons. Um, submitting to the repository can help increase the visibility and reach of your publications. The NOAA Institutional Repository is indexed by all major search engines, so Google, Yahoo, Bing, uh, what, what are the other ones, DuckDuckGo, all, all the search engines. Um, in fact, half of the repository's traffic comes from search engines. So that means people are putting in Google searches for different kinds of research and it's pointing you, pointing them to the repository. Um, in addition to just that search engine traffic, once you're in the repository, we've set up a number of tools and mechanisms to help aid in discoverability of documents and research materials. So you are able to search by author information, um, author name, you can search by series, titles, topics, the line office, program office. Uh, you can search by a DOI if you have a DOI. The repository is full text searchable. So whenever you search for anything, you can just drop in some keywords. If they show up in the document, in the text of the document, it will be returned in your results. Another reason to submit to the repository, uh, the NOAA Institutional Repository provides reliable, long-term access to your publication with persistent links. Uh, the IR serves as the PDF archive for all of NOAA research. We're working to include uh, currently NOAA series dating back to 1970. Uh, journal articles at this point, we're only going back to 2015. So we're, we're trying to include as much as we can with the resources available. Um, all NOAA publications, with library assigned to DOIs, so those tech memo series, tech report series that have DOIs, those DOIs point to the institutional repository page. It points to the documents landing page in the IR. With that being said, all URLs in the repository are unique. So if a document does not have a DOI assigned to it, if it's a tech memo from 1993, we did not assign a DOI to it, but the URL for that item in the repository is a permanent and unique URL. 
uh, so you can sort of treat it like a DOI without it being technically a DOI. And finally, why should you submit to the IR? Because we are one NOAA, right? We are trying to um, bring together all of NOAA's research, and that's what the institutional repository does. Each office, each program sort of has their own website, and they have their publications on there, and there's multiple different places people can go to find NOAA research. The point of the IR is to have a one-stop shop for all things NOAA research and publications and that's what the IR is and that's what we're trying to do so the more things that we get into the repository the more things that are submitted to us the better it is for searchers and researchers trying to find our publications so our last why is why do I have to make my items section 508 compliant when you submit we have told you that all items uh, need to be Section 508 compliant. And specifically, people have asked, why is this a thing now? Why do we have to worry about this now? It was never a requirement before. And there's a couple different reasons. Um, the section, section 508 of the Rehabilitation Act of 1973 has sort of always existed from since 1973. It was revamped in, I believe it was 1998, to include electronic materials. And then there's been a number of revisions since then. The reason that um, now it appears to be more of a thing is, is there, there has been some uh, lax enforcement over the years in regards to, to putting things online and their requirement to be Section 508 compliance, or compliant. As of January 18th, 2018, um, the new revised Section 508 requirements have come out. They are stricter. There are heftier penalties for not complying with it. And so um, we're, we're trying to, I don't wanna say ease everyone into it, but we're trying to do our best to make sure that the materials that we are putting up from January of 2018 forward are section 508 compliant to meet with those new rules. Um, it is also stated in par that the items submitted to the repository need to be 508 compliant. Um, I've included the, the link to PAR here, the section and the quote directly from PAR that the items do need to be in an accessible format, specifically PDF accessible format. And finally, if we improve access through these accessibility measures for people with disabilities, we're, it, it's another way of looking at it in terms of increasing access and increasing the reach of our research. So documents that people couldn't necessarily access before can access them now, which means our science is getting out there to more people and helping more people. So with that, I'm gonna actually flip it over to Sarah. She's gonna talk a little bit about the bibliometrics list and DOIs. Hello. So, as part of our bibliometrics program, the library produces a list of NOAA articles that we release quarterly and annually. And we get a lot of questions about how this list is different than the IR, and specifically why, if we have a list of NOAA articles, why people still need to submit to the IR. Well, for starters, the list is limited just to articles and only those that are indexed in the Web of Science and have a NOAA affiliation listed somewhere in that text. Um, also, the list that appears on the website currently only includes articles by NOAA authors and contractors, not those articles by grantees or other people receiving funding from NOAA, and those articles are required by PAR. The IR, on the other hand, includes not just articles, but tech memos, tech reports, annual reports, reports to Congress, all the reports, um, and, and a lot of other different kinds of NOAA documents, both those covered by PAR and those that we've deemed to be appropriate for the IR. The biggest difference is that the bibliometric list is just citations of articles, whereas the IR contains the articles themselves. Um, either pre-publication manuscripts or publisher PDFs of open access articles. It's 
it's an issue of the list containing information and the IR containing actual objects. So ultimately, the list the bibliometrics team produces and the IR serve very different purposes, and that's why they're different. Um, the list is meant to provide a count of articles, which we use to help assess NOAA's research output. And the IR is meant to make that research output available to the public and comply with PAR, which is why we still need submission. But having a list on our part, we are more than happy to provide that with people and break it down by your office and help you figure out what uh, what's been published and needs to be submitted. So our final question, our last how, concerns unique identifiers and how they relate to the IR. We mostly deal with two kinds of identifiers. Identifiers for publications like DOIs and identifiers for authors like ORCID and Researcher ID. For NOAA publications, the library assigns DOIs, and those DOIs point to the IR, as Jen mentioned earlier. Uh, to get a DOI for your publication, you just need to request one during the submission process. Or if you'd like to embed that DOI in the final document that gets published, you can request a reserved DOI using a Google form. If you can't find that, just contact us at the repository email address, and we can send that to you. The library does not, however, assign DOIs to journal articles. Those are publisher assigned. But we do link to the publisher DOIs from the article landing pages in the IR. And if there is no article DOI, we link to the publisher landing page. There's always a link back to the publisher. For authors, we have ORCID IDs and researcher IDs. There are a number of different unique identifiers available for authors, but those are the two that are mostly widely used and recommended by the library. Currently, we're not actually able to incorporate these in the IR, but we are working with our partners at the CDC to try to develop those capabilities, and we encourage people to still get those IDs. They are really easy to set up. Once you have one, it's easy to link from the other. You can put them on everything you do, not just peer-reviewed research, uh, posters that go to conferences, presentations. It's a good way to link your entire portfolio. It makes it easier to track your publications and impact and really helps to build an online scholarly presence if that's something you're interested in doing. So that's what we have right now and we're going to open up the floor to questions. Do you have any? I do. A uh, question about uh, DOIs. Yes. So if I'm, if I remember right, the repository, one of the things the repository takes is pre-publication manuscripts. Mm -hmm. So it's, if it isn't published, does it, maybe it doesn't have a DOI from the publisher yet? Well, there's a question from the room about DOIs and pre-publication manuscripts of journal articles. We do take pre-publication manuscripts for articles to, um, to comply with copyright restrictions, but we don't make those available until the article has been published, and those would have a DOI. So there's still a DOI, it's just not necessarily embedded in the document. If there is no DOI, we would link to the publisher's landing page for that article when it's published. Um, if, if something's in pre-publication and you have a manuscript you'd like to submit to us, we will process it and hold on to it, and as soon as it's published, put it up with the DOI and all the citation information when it's ready to go. Okay. We make it easy. Katie? Are there any questions from online? Go ahead oh, if you have another one. Have another question. Okay. Um, so earlier on, you were talking about Section 8 of the directive, and you said the library must receive a digital copy of every NOAA authored and NOAA something else document. Sponsored or sponsored. Sponsored. 
So yep, that yep. means like grantees? Grantees, exactly. Things um, that are coming from the cooperative institutes, um, anything that is produced by a, a NOAA grant or NOAA funding of some sort. Okay. So, and because you also said that everything that's submitted must be 508 compliant, does that mean that we granting offices need to make our grantees everything they produce be 508 compliant? In theory, yes. So there are a couple caveats to the 508 compliance. Sorry, I'll get a little closer. There are a couple caveats to making things 508 compliant. If, um, say, your grantee publishes a journal article in an open access journal, with open access journals, we are able to use the publisher's version, which is not going to be 508 compliant. Necessarily. Necessarily. Some journals do make their documents 508 compliant, which is great, but oftentimes the publisher's version is not 508 compliant. Because we are allowed to use the publisher's version, and most publishers ask that we use that version, we waive the 508 requirements on those. So if we're able to use the publisher's version, we don't we don't look at the 508 require uh, the 508 on that item. Now, if someone is submitting a manuscript to us, or if it is a NOAA tech memo, it does need to be 508 compliant when it comes to us. So I know that some offices have started um, adding in language in their grants uh, when they send out their their call for proposals and all that sort of stuff that includes language about um, produced materials need to be Section 508 compliant. I have gotten questions from grantees um, asking for resources on 508 compliance, which we do have. Uh, the library has created a Section 508 LibGuide, um, sorry, uh, subject guide, that um, is available to everyone. It is not just NOAA available, it is available to anyone and everyone, the public, that offers some t uh, tips, tricks, guidance. There's a number of resources on there. It does also link to a number of webinars that we have done here in NOAA, explaining what we're looking for in terms of 508 compliance and how to make materials 508 compliant. So ultimately, Yes, the grantee should be making it compliant. I know some offices are doing that work for them. It, it's really, we, we leave it mostly up to the office and whoever's submitting it to us. Okay, a few questions, Sure. Um, what do you do when you receive an article that matches what NOAA does, but also may share a topic area with another department of the federal government? Let me, let me try to summarize that. So someone had a question about article. So um, what do you do when you receive an article that matches what NOAA does? So a subject area that NOAA covers, but also may share a topic area with another department in the federal government. So um, if it is a NOAA produced or authored item, we would include it into the repository we do get a number of publications that are joint publications between some NOAA office or program working with um, Department of Interior, NASA, something like that. We include their information as well. So if someone were to find that item in the repository, they would be able to see that it was NOAA produced as well as produced with NASA or the uh, US Fish and Wildlife Service or whatever it may be. So we do provide some of that information in there. In terms of linking it with other agencies' repositories, we don't do that right now unless um, they hold the data for that publication. So what we do in the repository is if there is a data set that goes along with that publication, we ask that you provide us with a URL or a DOI for that, and we do link to that directly um, from the publication page in the repository. Hopefully that answers that question, but if not, let, let me, let us know and we can try to narrow it down more. Okay. Um, can the IR act as a preprint server like um, archive? 
Uh, the question is, can the IR act as a preprint server? Oh, it's up here. So I guess people can see those. Do you want to take that one? Like an archive? Well, archive is an actual service and I'm not, I'm not familiar enough with it to say whether or not the NOAA IR acts as exactly a similar service. We are able to provide those assuming that there is a NOAA author, contractor, or grantee on the author list. So yes, we can include those because it's government, like it's government produced research and we are able to include manuscripts that do not have publisher added content. So no pagination, no logos, um, no formatting from them. In terms of how, how it functions similarly to archive, I'm afraid we can't elaborate more because we don't work with archive. Uh, so I can see this one. I'll, I'll read it out, save you the time, maybe. Um, the question is, if we funded grants or contracts prior to October 2015, but these partners are just now publishing their work, are they still required to submit their manuscripts to the NOAA IR? Short answer, no. Um, back in June, we did do a whole round bag focusing on grantees and contracts. Um, where we covered this, but I, I'm happy to cover it again. So it's, this is an excellent question. The language of the grant, the grants that were awarded prior to 2015 does not have any mention of a requirement to submit to the repository. So no, those items don't. It, it's all based on the language within the grant. Um, since it, and when the grant was awarded. So if the grant was awarded post October 1, 2015, they would fall under the requirements, but if it was awarded prior to October 1st, 2015, excuse me, then they would not have to submit those. Hopefully that helps. If not, again, we did do a brown bag that was recorded and it is on our YouTube channel back in June, uh, specifically about um, grantees and their requirements. And the last question is, how do you associate a tech report or other document in the IR with a related data set um, discoverable, discoverable via data.noaa.gov? We are including, um, let me back up. When you submit a document, we ask that you please provide the URL or DOI for your data set if it is available. So upon submission, say you have your document and you also have your data set DOI, there is a section for it in your submission form. We ask that you put it in there. And what we do is we link to it directly from the document. There is a section in the repository under each document called supporting files. And that is where we link to any data sets that are provided to us. If at the time of submission to the repository, you do not have that DOI or URL, but you get it after the fact. You can always email us at noaa.repository at noaa.gov. Let us know the publication that we need to attach that data set to, and we can attach that data set after the fact, even after you've submitted. Um, again, because of resources, we're not able to sort of hunt down data sets right now as much as we'd like to, so that's why we ask that people provide that information to us. Like we don't have any other questions. Any other questions in the room? Yes, sir. A follow-up question to what you just said. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned that you had a June brown bag okay. where you talked about was that a specifically a brown bag about this and this? Yes. yes. And that's recorded somewhere. It is. It is on the library's YouTube channel. Uh, there is a playlist called I think it's called Noah IR. And it would be, I don't remember the exact title of it, but I think it was like grantees and yeah, something like that, cooperative institutes and grantees or grantees and contracts, something like that. And that was um, a similar session to this that focused solely on grants and CIs. Yep. If we had publications that came from grants before, 
that where the grant was issued before October 1, mm -hmm. and we wanted to put it in the repository. Yeah. We'll take them. We'll take the question, just in case people didn't hear it, the question is if you have publications from prior, um, grant funded publications prior to October 1, 2015, and you want to submit them, please do. Uh, we are happy to take them. It is not required, but we will we will always take them. But if they're not 508 compliant? Then we will not take them. <laughs> Unless they are open access articles. Unless it's an open access journal article, or we can use the publisher's version. So some publishers will let us use their version of the document, even though they may not be open access, or if it's paid open access, we can use the publisher's version. So most AMS and AGU journals, we are able to include in the repository. In fact, they prefer us to use their copy in the repository, which has worked out very nicely for us. And there's a handful of other ones as well. Yes, sir. So, Say I've got I've got a PDF of a published article mm -hmm. that falls in this category. Is it likely to be 508 compliant? <laughs> I mean, are most things 508 compliant, or are most no. things not 508 compliant? Most things are not 508 compliant, okay. um, so and that goes for that no, no. We should never assume that it is. Most um, there are, as I said, some journals that make their PDFs 508 compliant. It's a small percentage. So almost any publisher's version of a document is not going to be 508 compliant. As people are creating documents like tech memos and, and tech reports and things of that nature, you have to, there are certain steps you have to take as you're creating those documents to make sure that they have all the accessibility elements that they require. Um, some parts of it may be automatically 508 compliant based on how you've structured your document, but it is not good to assume that it is because there are a number of things you have to kind of tweak and play with and make sure that are that appear in the document that are not sort of part of just creating a Word document. One, no? One more question. Sorry. I so no need to apologize. Time. We have 20 minutes still. Okay. So you have asked so all I, the questions. I've got this hypothetical I don't know, pile of PDFs mm -hmm. that are probably most of them are not 508 compliant. Is it hard to make something 508? Should I not bother or can I just push a button or buy a software or something and it magically becomes 508? It depends. It depends on the level of um, sort of, I want to call it like innate compliance, but like existing compliance within the document. So depending on how the document was structured, it's possible that you need to add some alternative text to your images and you're good to go. It's also possible there is nothing compliant about the document and it could take a long time to make it compliant. There's there's sort of a a large window of you know not compliant, sort of compliant. How long it takes. Um, people have spent upwards of a couple days making a document compliant. I've made some documents compliant in ten minutes. It just depends on the document, the length of it, the, the sort of structure of the item, what's in it. If something has a ton of pictures and graphs. It could take you a little bit because you have to add alternative text to those. Um, we have to check captions and reading order. There's there's a number of things that kind of go into it. But depending on how the document was created, if someone created the Word document using appropriate headings and used all the, the creation tools within Word correctly, it might not take long at all. So there, there's quite a bit of variance. And if you have pre-publication manuscripts, a lot of times the format required by publishers is, is rather unformatted. Mm -hmm. and it can actually be a little bit easier to make it compliant. It doesn't have all the bells and whistles. Mm -hmm. So those bells and whistles don't have to be renamed. <laughs> if, if it's kind of just straight text, you can tell it to ignore the number, like the line numbers and possibly put in some alt text. And mm -hmm. And call it. It go. might be easy. That's not true of all of them, but some of the formats required by publishers for submission are fairly easy to fix. And we've we've gathered a number of tools, and I've done a couple webinars that walk you through creating a document and fixing common errors, and those are also available on our YouTube channel.
Um, also, if you have a document and you're having a hard time, you can always contact us. Um, you can contact me directly if you want, and I can take a look at it, try to walk you through it. Um, you can send it to the repository, and we can do a 508 check on it and let you know what needs to be fixed. So, did, did you say that Adobe has a check? It'll do it itself? does. Yes, okay. there is a there is the um, Adobe Accessibility Checker, and that's what we use. Um, we have to make do with the tools that ha we have available and that are most widely available throughout NOAA, and that's Adobe. So Adobe Pro does have an ac accessibility checker. Word does as well. Uh, yes, Word does as well. And the newest version of Word, what is it, 2017, whichever, whatever the newest version of Microsoft Word is, um, a lot of the accessibility elements that we require are sort of built in. So when you insert an image or a figure, you're gonna automatically get a little pop-up that says, what's your alternative text for this item? So it'll help you sort of pick up on some of the elements that we require. Cool. Anything else online? Nope, okay. Do you have any other questions? Okay, yeah. all right. Well, if anything else comes up, please feel free to email us or the repository, and uh, we will see you all in October. Thank you. Thank you.